and yeah so welcome thank you everyone for joining us to the um early career award final for 2021 this year it's being held by the early career network of the geological society um it is the first time that we've held it um, the reason for that, and I'll just quickly explain uh, who we are and why we've ended up holding it today, is that the educational department in the Geological Society sadly has had to um, reduce in size over the past couple of months. And the Geological Society approached the Early Career Network that has been, was, we were formed about two years ago and asked us whether or not it was something we would be interested in, in taking over and continuing. And, we unanimous, unanimously um, said, yes, we would love to do it. It is such a representation of what our network is about. It's about people trying new things. It's about trying to um, do some training, do some extra CPD. But it's also about meeting new people and seeing what else is going on um, in the wider geological um, yeah, area. So. We took it on and we're hosting the final based on the regional heats that happened in the back end of 2020 and the start of 2021. Um, so firstly, thank you so much to the regional teams for continuing to put on presentations throughout the pandemic and for allowing the regional heats to take part. So thank you so much for them and also to the educational team who've put so much hard work in getting this uh, prestigious event going and keeping it going so many years. Um, specifically, um, we do want to say thank you to a few people. Um, I've just forgotten, which is awful. Um, to Rose Want, who's really sort of pulled this together for us and helped us. So today we've got four finalists um, who have joined us and they're having to do it virtually, which is not quite the atmosphere that we're all hoping for. Um, we'd love to be in Burlington House doing it all in person and then having a drink afterwards, but everyone's making do with what they have um, at the moment. The main thank yous we want to do as well are to the three judges that we have today. They've taken their time out of their very busy schedules to um, join us and to judge these talks. Could we just do a quick um, hello from each of the three judges, please? Um, and just maybe give a quick word about your background and where you've come from. Um, so if I start with Peter, if you could yep. just do a quick introduction of yourself and uh, maybe where you work as well. Yep, hello. Um, I'm a uh, postdoctoral researcher. I work at the Open University uh, in Milton Keynes and I work on characterising the landing site that will be where the ExoMars rover, the European Space Agency, Miles rover will be landing in 2022-2023. So my research is sort of geomorphological remote sensing of Mars. I come from a geology and volcanology background, and that's why I'm uh, you know here today as one of the specialist judges. So thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for coming, Peter. Um, we also have Dr. Ursula Lawrence with us today. Do you want to just um, say hello, Ursula? Um, hopefully, my video is working. Um, Hi, I'm Ursula Lawrence. I'm um, Associate Director of Engineering Geology. Um, I work for Capital Real Estate and Infrastructure, um, primarily on um, infrastructure works, um, highways, railways, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm, I suppose I could be described as a soft rock applied geologist. <laughs> You can call yourself whatever you like, whatever you feel. <laughs> and um, we've also got Simon, oh, Dr. Simon Domney with us today. If you can just quickly say hello. I'm sorry, I'm, you I, <laughs> I'm stuffing myself with pizza here, so don't worry about it. Um, I'm a uh, joint mining geologist, mining engineer, um, 25 year veteran, um, currently, currently involved in active open cut and, uh, and, and underground mining operations in um, a bizarre number of places, including Australia, Colombia, Peru, and, um, and Scotland at the moment. No wonder you're very busy. <laughs> but thank you all for joining <laughs> us today. <laughs> we do appreciate it. So 
for those um, who might not be so aware of the format, the judges have a scoring sheet that they will be um, scoring our four presenters on today. Um, the winner um, today will take home, well, virtually take home. Sadly, uh, the trophy will not be able to pass hands today as we would hope. Um, but there is a, a trophy and um, a hundred pound gift voucher for the winner. But everyone who's actually got to the final today wins a free one year membership to um, yeah, to the Geological Society, um, just to recognise the fact that getting to the final is such an achievement in itself. The final thing to do is just, just to reiterate really how um, proud we are in people coming forward and how impressed we have been about the um, commitment people have had to this event through the difficult year everyone's had. And yeah, everyone on this call and everyone joining is just really interested to hear um, what everyone has to say about what they've been up to. Is that okay, Matt, if I open up? I don't know if you've got another slide. Uh, yes, please, Deborah. I'll stop sharing and the hand over to the first presenter, please. Perfect. So presenting first is going to be David Tudor. Um, and yes, yeah, so if you want to share your screen, I'll, as I said, I'll just pop my virtual hand up um, just in case you need any help with timing. And um, yeah, enjoy. Um. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Tudor, uh, and I'm going to be presenting my MSc dissertation research project that I undertook while at Imperial College. And the topic of that uh, dissertation was a stability assessment of an abandoned Victorian chalk mine and the influence of brittle geological structures. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm a graduate geotechnical engineer. I work for Mott MacDonald in Cardiff. I did my undergraduate degree in geology at the University of Bristol. Whilst I was at Bristol, I was part of a, an outreach program where we would go to uh, local primary schools and just to get the um, local children just excited about geology and STEM subjects as a broader topic. Uh, once I finished my degree, I went on to do an MSc in soil mechanics at Imperial College. Um, and then I've finished there and came to Mount McDonald. Since joining Mott McDonald, I've gone back to the University of Bristol with a colleague of mine because we're both uh, alumni from the university and we've presented um, to the undergraduate students about the geotechnical industry, how they can apply their ge geology degree and how they can get involved with Mott McDonald and the geotechnical industry. So today I'll go through a background to my project, what the main objectives were, how I undertook the stability assessment and then a bit more of a wider total rock and damage zone assessment that I undertook as part of the project. And I'll finish with some concluding remarks. So the chalk is a fine grained white calcareous sedimentary rock comprised of small mic uh, marine microorganisms. And it was deposited uh, in the Cretaceous and is overlain by paleogene sediments, including uh, the London and Reading clay. It's a very porous material with uh, fluid flow being directed along its discontinuities. It's a low strength material that shows a wide uh, spectrum of behavior, both brittle and ductile, and has undergone several cycles of deformation to form the brittle geological structures observed today. So we see that um, in the southeast, we can see evidence of perennial and alpine orogenic events, as well as periglacial cycles. So the chalk historically and remains a very important resource. Today, chalk is England's largest aquifer, but historically it was mined to make lime to be used in early construction practices. But unfortunately, the scars of this old industrial practice are sporadically exposed and sometimes with quite devastating effects. Historic chalk mines can be found all across the chalk outcrop, but they are particularly present in the southeast. They typically collapse through crown hole, which is uh, a collapse of the crown of an underground mine tunnel. Uh, with recent examples including Pinnerwood School in Watford and Field Road in Reading. Crownal collapse is typically initiated by rigid block movement and rock creep and the development of voids due to the karstic nature of chalk. Underground works in the chalk often overlook the influence of small uh, rock features including slick and sides and joints and um, fractures. But fortunately, some abandoned mines are recorded and are accessible, thus providing a safe example for predicting and observing the influence of these brittle geological structures. The purpose of my master's dissertation was to investigate the stability of an underground uh, abandoned mine and to see the influence of these brittle geological structures. So here we can see on this image where the mine was based. So it was the Emma Green Old 
uh, chalk mine just north of Reading. Mining in Reading dates back to the early 1400s. However, during the 1700s, mining practices improved. Um, it's improved in quotation marks, I suppose, because compared to today, they're quite primitive. But these improved methods was uh, to tunnel in such a way to expose the archway and deflect the uh, stress from the roof onto the pillars. So the main aims and objectives of the project were to assess the overall stability of your mine using a variety of methods, uh, to collect a significant amount of structural data, as well as photographs and uh, lots of descriptions to try and characterize the main failure mechanisms within the mine, and to assess the influence of brittle geological structures on the stability and how these structures affect the rock mass properties of the chalk. So how did I collect the data? So to assess the rock mass characterization of the chalk, uh, I employed several different data collection methods. So I collected a lot of structural data. I did this using an app called Field Move, which utilizes the Compass Clino on your phone. And from that, you can take the dip and dip direction of uh, any planar or linear feature, including bedding, jointing, fractures, slick insides, um, you name it. Uh, I also took, undertook some damage zone assessed, uh, estimation. So there were lots of uh, faults within the mine. So and the damage zone is the area surrounding a fault which has been damaged. So to assess the width of the damage zone and the influence of this on the stability, I undertook some scanline surveys across the faults. So I would measure off three or four meters and then uh, measure off where the discontinuities would intersect the scanline and then note its general features. I uh, also used lots of rock mass classifications and I'll detail those in a minute. And then I just took lots of photographs and as many detailed descriptions as I could. So some of the rock mass classification systems are used. So here we see at the top, the Syria classification, which is quite simple and it just incorporates the discontinuity spacing and the aperture. I also use the geological strength index, which uses uh, the, the rock mass structure and the surface condition and assigns a value to it. And then finally the rock mass rating system, which incorporates the strength of the rock as well as the ground conditions, in addition to the groundwater conditions, sorry, in addition to the discontinuity condition. To, so to assess the strength of the rock, I use several methods, including a low strength Schmidt hammer shown in the photo below. Um, this uses a pendulum system. So the weight uh, you, is released, it impacts with the chalk, it rebounds and that rebound value can then be used to correlate a UCS value. So getting into the nitty gritty of the data, here we see the global stereo nets for um, the mine. So on the left hand side, we've got the global data set for joints. So we can see, although there's a reasonable scatter in the data that we've got three near vertical joint sets. In the center, in the middle stereo net, we've got three uh, dominant modes of faulting with the dominant direction of faulting to the southwest. And then on the right hand side, we've got the slick insides, which tie up really nicely with that dominant uh, direction of faulting to the southwest. So once I'd collected all that structural data, I uh, undertook a kinematic analysis using the software DIPS and the inbuilt kinematic analysis function. So I assessed for planar toppling and wedge sliding failure. And I assessed for each corridor. So there were 30 corridors in total in the mine. So I assessed for each side of the um, each corridor for several different wall dips. I analyzed over 200 stereo nets uh, and it was localized wall failures were prevalent throughout the mine in all corridors and some corridors displayed all three types of um, failure mechanisms but wedge failure was by far and above the most common failure mechanism predicted by the kinematic analysis. So stepping back a bit then, having assessed the stability of the mine, it was important to try to assess the roles of these geological structures that were causing these planar wedge and toppling sliding failures and how they were affecting the stability. So I did this using scanline surveys, field descriptions and photographs. So here we can see some photographs from within the mine. On the left hand side, we can see the mottled chalk um, as a result of faulting. So this is the center of a very wide fault in corridor 20. And we can see that the mottled texture was really soft, very friable, it would just fall away. On the right hand side, we see a much smaller fault in terms of the width of the mottled texture in the core of the fault. But we can see the brown staining on the walls. We can see that groundwater is 
flowing preferentially along these structures into the mine, even though the mine was above groundwater level. In that photo, we also see a good example of wedge sliding failure, which was unrelated to the um, faulting event. We can see that pop out wedge failure. In addition to the faulting and the, pre, uh, the joints that were prevalent within the mine, we've also got fault initiated fractures. So during the faulting event, we've got fractures that are forming as a result. Um, and therefore the greater concentration of possible discontinuities the greater your chance of sliding can occur and thus influencing the stability. So looking at the data that I collected, very simply, if we plot the cumulative number of fractures, we can see that there is a trilinear relationship in these um, graphs. So in blue, we have a very slow rise in fracture accumulation, followed by a rapid rise in orange, and then we have the plateauing stage in gray. So when we use what Choi et al um, their method for estimating the width of a damage zone. So the point of inflection of your cumulative number of fractures defines the width of your damage zone. So applying this method and knowing observationally what we've seen in the mine, we can see that the blue um, points and the slow rise in fractures initially um, define that mottled texture of the chalk. Then we have the rapid rise in fractures and then we have that inflection point which uh, characterizes the width, the edge of that damage zone, and then you're into the country rock. This is supported by Myolital, who uh, released a paper, I think it was a week or two weeks, through, maybe three weeks before I handed in. Um, and they uh, suggested that they had observed a trilinear pattern of fracture accumulation for carbonate rocks, which was further evidence to what I'd uh, observed within the mine. So how does this actually affect how are these brittle geological structures affecting the stability? So in this photograph, we can see an overlay of successive bench failures I've highlighted on the bottom photo. So from red to green to blue, we can see that um, the, the bedding has collapsed from one flint bed to another flint bed within the Seaford chalk in the mine. And this is, uh, I'm stood on a large pile of rubble. So the roof above me has also collapsed. And you can see the people in the distance in the high vis, how the mine sort of corridor dips away to the left. In purple then, we can see there's a fault also running through this corridor and into the roof. And when we zoom in on that a little bit, we can see that we've got a joint surface which interacts with that mottled damage uh, chalk uh, uh, soft texture and it's caused a pop out isolated roof failure within uh, within the roof. So we can see in these two photos alone, two very different styles and methods of uh, failure. So when we break that down to the different failure mechanisms, we can see on the left hand side that pop out roof failure, which typically then causes a domino effect. So you might have a, a planar sliding failure or a wedge sliding failure from either the side wall or the roof which then causes a domino effect and then it cycles through the roof and then they occur one after the other. Or we observed uh, one singular event where the whole roof will collapse in one event from one flint bed to another overriding flint bed because that flint bed can provide that greater tensile strength. Uh, but typically they work in tandem with each other. So you might have that isolated pop out roof failure which then triggers a whole roof collapse or you might have a whole roof collapse, which might then nibble away a little bit extra just by the weight and the force of it all collapsing. It might nibble away, cause that pop out failure, which then triggers a domino effect. So they, they are working together. So briefly, uh, some of the challenges with this project. So access, I only had three site visits to the mine. The mine was quite large and the corridors are five to 10 meters wide and they ranged in length, so some were 10 or 15 meters long and others were 70 plus meters. So there was a lot of uh, data to gather. So it was important to be quite methodical in my approach and thoroughly plan what I wanted to do. And luckily I had uh, two PhD students and my supervisor come with me and they were obviously doing their own research, but if they could assist, I would debrief them on what, what I wanted to gather and what I wanted to achieve uh, during that site visit at that time. Obviously, to improve my productivity, I use an app called Field Move Clino, which I mentioned earlier, which uses the Compass Clino on your phone. Uh, 
and obviously you can measure that dip and dip direction, like I mentioned. However, published literature has indicated that the data can drift when you're collecting it through the phone, particularly with Android phones. So it's important that myself and anyone who was using the FieldMove Kleino app to regularly ch double check their measurements against the old school handheld compass Kleino method. And if it was appearing to drift, just to switch back to the old school method and uh, to sort of uh, go back to the tried and trusted method. So to conclude, uh, most small collapses observed in the underground chalk mine was attributed to stress relief. Uh, and they, it was typically collapses caused by retreating to an upper layer that was the flint beds, because they can provide that better tensile strength than the chalk can. Uh, we observed two different styles of failure. So there was that pop out roof failure and the total roof collapse, but they were typically working in tandem with each other. When analyzing the stability of underground uh, excavations, although kinematic analysis is a really useful quick analytical tool, it should be coupled with another method. So recently I've used Swedge, uh, which assigns a factor of safety to that uh, wedge sliding failure. And finally, damage zones in the Seaford Chalk demonstrated a trilinear fracture accumulation relationship. And more broadly, the um, scanline surveys were a very good method of uh, mapping out the width of your damage zone. So you can target your stability method for any open excavations within the chalk. Thank you very much for listening. Great. That was um, that was really interesting and bang on time. I was looking forward to my doing my timing thing, but you didn't need it. So I will um, open the floor to um, any questions from the judges. Okay, I'll kick off. I've got one. Thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, general one, you say that you um, applied or looked at three different kinds of um, discontinuity ratings, GSIR, Syria, and rock mass ratings. Um, yeah. What were the main differences between between the outputs you got from those? Did you get so, any, any sensible conclusions from, from, from applying those? Yeah, so from applying those, it was apparent that there wasn't much variation in the classification that you've got within the country rock. So if you were not within the zones damaged by the faulting, yep. they were all relatively consistent throughout the mine. So you uh, discontinuities that was dominantly jointing across the mine was quite consistent. So uh, the classifications were, yeah, were really consistent across the mine, apart from within those, fault, the, those faults. So that would vary. So like I showed in the photograph earlier, some um, fault calls were quite narrow. So, but some fault calls were really wide, somewhere about half a meter wide. So obviously your classification did vary significantly, even within that corridor then. Did you find that the, um any one of the, the three classification uh, schemes was more or less useful for uh, predicting roof collapse? Uh, the serial classification was the least useful because it's the most basic, because it, it's only really describing your um, aperture width, uh -huh. uh, spacing and uh, aperture. Yeah. So it's, it, it it's useful to an extent, but it, it doesn't really classify the chalk very well, I found. It didn't capture the variation enough. Okay. So the GSIR um, and the, the rock mass ratings, um, you found them... Um, more, more useful, yeah. More definitely. useful. Um, yeah. Did, they have, uh, were they, they, did they have particular strengths or weaknesses associated with them? Uh, I would say the geological strength index has its own weakness because... Uh, when they derive, when they came up with a classification system, uh, it's in the recommendations. It says that you should provide a range of values rather than having one discrete value for each classification. But then, when you want to use the GSI for um, certain things, so I know uh, 
uh, rock science have uh, they've re they've released rs data and you provide a gsi value and you can derive mm. different rock mass parameters but you only specify one gsi value which then goes against why the 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 idea behind this classification itself yeah. so i leans more towards the rmr system personally i prefer okay. using it interesting um i've got a couple of other questions but i'll leave uh let the other judges have a go Yeah, the only the, the only one that I've got, given that you were working underground, what was your and you've not you didn't say anything in your um, presentation. What were your risk assessment procedures for for working underground, in, in particular when you're actually there and operating underground? Your your dynamic risk assessment. Um, so the risk assessment we had to do our own within the university. So we had to do a, a, a health and safety site risk assessment. So I undertook that with the PhD student. So we uh, highlighted the specific risks. So that was traveling to and from site. And then it was obviously working underground. Um, but that risk then was, we were under the supervision of those who operated the mine. So the mine was, uh, it's owned by the scouts. So they run and operate the mine. So you get lowered down by winch. So we had to have winch training, how to, what to do in the event of emergency. And they provided that um, risk assessment. And then they would go down before we would descend, they would go in, they would do their own, because they, they, I think they were obviously more trained than we are. They would, they would risk assess the mine in the current state that it was in. And then they would decide if it was safe or not for us to enter. So that's how the, the, the risk was captured really. And the, the university had to rubber stamp our uh, risk assessment. Um, if I can, oh yes, Peter. I, I have I have a question. So, not being a, a mining geologist, I, thought, uh, I th actually thought you did a great job explaining what was going on. I really sort of followed on what followed on what was going on with the rock masses and the ceilings in particular. One thing that I didn't know though. Um, so could you explain to me what the what you mean by the, the trilinear relation of shape of fracture accumulation? That was the only thing that I didn't quite follow through, although maybe it's something that I feel like I ought to know. I would have yeah. known had I been an engineering geologist. So, so the chalk uh, is a very strange material. So it has a ductile and brittle, brittle response. So mm -hmm. it can undergo sort of like a remolding, more like a, like a soil would. Um, but it can then can have brittle uh, responses like a rock would. So when it's um, damaged by the fault, you've got this remolding within near the fault core. So you don't have these brittle structures as such. You've got that remodeled, uh, mottled, remolded texture like I showed in the photographs. But then that will then transition into the more um, brittle response from the ductile. So you'd have, so the trilinear relationship is you have very little accumulation of fractures or these um, brittle um, geological structures. And then once you're out of the remolded section, you're then into the brittle response. So then you start accumulating fractures rapidly because um, then the, there's a transition in the rock's response, but then you're then into the country rock. So you are outside the zone of influence of that um, fra uh, fra faulting event. And then you have the, the baseline uh, discontinuities present in the rock mass. Okay, that's, that's great. I could go and explain that to someone else now. That's fantastic, oh, okay. thanks. And, and perfectly finished the five minutes of questions. So <laughs> um, I didn't have to be the bad guy and jump in and stop you mid really interesting explanation there, because I'm also not an engineering geologist as well. So, um, so thank you for that, David. You can now relax. And um, yeah, watch everyone else go through. Um, so Tom Pickard is going to be next and he's joining us from Thames Valley Regional Group. Hi there. So can you see my screen? We can, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, my name is Tom Pickard and I'm an engineering geologist working for ACOM. This presentation is going to tell a story of a day trip I had to a place called Al Ula whilst working on a project in Saudi Arabia. Um, the present, uh, presentation is going to give you some context as to why I was in Saudi Arabia and what I was doing there. Uh, then I'll briefly run through an overview of the geology of the area. 
And with the main focus of this presentation, uh, I'm going to look at kinematic failure. So I'll give a description of what kinematic failure is, and then look at how it manifests at this site. I'll then talk about what data we were looking for on site, how we collected it, and how we presented it to the client. Uh, I'll go through how I concluded my work on this project and what we recommended to the client. And I'll finish with a brief discussion about the word risk. So for some context, uh, I was one of two geologists that were in country for two to three months doing some geological mapping and site reconnaissance for another much larger project. But once word got out that there were some geologists in country, we were asked to spend our day off helping on another project, which we were more than happy to do because a change of scenery is always nice. For some geographical reference, we have the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to the east uh, and Egypt to the west with the Red Sea dividing the two. We were staying in a place called Tabuk, which was about a three hour drive south to Alula. We were given some information before rocking up to the site, but the project is ongoing, so I'm going to be discreet about the details. So firstly, we were told that the aim of our site visit was to concentrate on the central area shown in this slide. And this is an extract from a layout plan that we were sent. Uh, and although I've covered up the building layout, the interesting information is surrounding it. Right from the go that we can see one of the primary areas that they are trying to develop has some existing slope failures around it. Um, and for scale, the slopes here are about 80 meters high and they're near vertical. And there's some 10 ton excavators down at the bottom for some scale. I'll add that there was a previous site visit that had already been completed by ACOM uh, where some recommendations had already been made principally that the buildings needed to be offset from the slopes uh, by at least one to 1 1.5 times the height of the slopes. So moving on to the geology, um, the site is located within the Ashar Valley. The geology of the Ashar Valley is comprised of Paleozoic rocks of the Kuwera sandstone and the overlying Ram and Umsam sandstones. At this site, we're looking at the Ram and Umsam sandstones. So I'm going to show you some drone footage of the area now, so it's a little easier to see what I'm talking about. I really hope it plays. So the Ram and Umsam sandstones are comprised of light yellow, locally cross-bedded sandstones. They weather to these really beautiful pinnacles and spires as a result of erosion along two sets of vertical joints that are at right angles to each other. So you can see a weathering profile on the surface of the rock that gives it this sort of honeycomb effect. That's called tophony which is common in hot areas and it's caused here by a combination of wetting and drying and extreme diurnal temperature changes. This is a block that detached at some point for me to get a quick description of. And you can see a few more detached blocks in the background and more of the Tofoni weathering on the slopes behind. So hopefully I'm building up a picture for you of what this site looks like. Overlying the sandstone is a Cenozoic succession known as the Herat Ueru, which was at one point a volcanic lava field. The Harataway Rid forms a northeast uh, or northwest trend in the plateau that's about 225 kilometers long and it covers about 7,000 square kilometers. Our site is actually right on the boundary of the Harat, which is a little more obvious if I zoom out. Um, and you can see the approximate boundary of the main Harat, which forms a thick layer of basalt over the underlying sandstone. And then you have the more localized basalt deposits beyond the rough boundary of the Harat, like this one here. Um, which is above our site. So if you keep an eye on that uh, image that I've highlighted, that's what you're seeing in the image here. So you have layers of alkaline olivine basalt overlying the ram and on the sand sandstones. Moving on to kinematic stability now. Um, so for those not familiar with the term, the kinematic stability of a slope refers to the geometrically possible motion of a body of rock out of the slope. And that's controlled by the structure of the rock. So what do I mean by that? The structure of the rock is the, it refers to the discontinuities or the joints present throughout the rock mass, like what's shown in the diagram. Um, and it's the relationship between the orientation of these joints together with the orientation of the slope face that predominantly governs the kinematic stability of a slope. Kinematic stability often looks at three main modes of failure, um, which we might already be familiar with. Uh, plane failure is sliding along a single planar discontinuity that dips or daylights out of the face. Uh, then we have wedge failure, which is caused by the interaction of and failure along more than one discontinuity. And finally, there's toppling failure, which is common in layered or blocky rock slopes, where blocks can rotate about their base and overturn. So kind of moving away from that now, and we'll return to kinematics once I've sort of talked about the site-specific data. 
So the plan for our data collection was dynamic. <laughs> and by that, I mean, we didn't have a lot of time. We were geologists, we are geologists, and we knew what information would likely be useful to the project, uh, but we didn't know exactly how it might be used going forward. Um, as I've mentioned, information about discontinuities is arguably the most important factor for kinematic stability. So this information being three-dimensional isn't easy to visualize, but you can display it on a 2D plot known as a stereo net, which we've already seen, and I'm sure some of you are already familiar with. Um, so this is an example of a stereo net, which is essentially a bird's eye view of a sphere. And dissecting that sphere are different planes, which represent the discontinuities. Um, and hopefully that's shown on the right-hand diagram there. So I mentioned that we didn't have a huge amount of time to prepare for this site visit. Knowing the joint orientations would be important, I decided that it would be fun and useful to try and do a field stereo net to demonstrate to the client that these failures that we'd already seen on the site plans weren't random. Uh, so what you see here is a stereo net guide that I made out of some scrap cardboard. I think it was my uh, cereal box <laughs> using my pen knife. And that helped me draw the discontinuities that we saw in the field uh, onto a stereo net, which actually came out all right. And I'll show you that a bit later. As far as the data collection goes, uh, an emphasis, a heavy emphasis was placed on taking lots of photos. We only had a limited amount of time here. Um, and I think you know, that should be the case with any form of site reconnaissance anyway. Uh, and I quickly got to work recording discontinuity information. So for a detailed analysis, you would want to do scanline surveys across the length of the slope and build up a representative set of discontinuity data. And we didn't have the time or the safe means to do this. So essentially I stayed back and approximated the joint orientations from where I was standing. Now, obviously that's not ideal and it really limits the accuracy and the uh, reliability of the data. Um, fortunately, we were assisted by satellite imagery and the client's drone. Um, so we were actually able to get a real time aerial view of the site. And that was really helpful in giving us a big picture view. And I'll show you what I mean by that now. Um, so we started by identifying all of the major joint sets and recording the approximate orientations of each. Uh, we can see that we've got a few sub-vertical sets, uh, one or two sub-horizontal sets, and a few random joints. And I've tried to indicate the projection of these with arrows. So as, once we've identified the main joint sets, we can start to sort of fill in the gaps um, and work out things like joint spacing, persistence, aperture, and all these other important parameters that we would use to do a more detailed analysis. Now, due to the limitations of our data collection on this day, we were only really concerned with, oh, sorry, only really concerned with um, approximating the orientations and putting together a rough stereo net. Um, but typically you would use this sort of big picture approach and you'd look at the interactions of the joints and start to work out things like the potential block sizes, uh, shape, volume, and maybe the likely kinematic failure mechanisms as well. So I took this information, I did my best to plot it on a stereo net, which is here, and it did turn out okay. It demonstrated that planar wedge and toppling failures were all possible. But at this point, we had all sort of established the pointing at the existing and uh, future failures and using our hands to demonstrate the failure mechanisms was doing a lot more to help the client's understanding than the stereo net would have. So it ended up just being some good practice for me, which is always good. Um, and in case you can't work out what I've done here in the field, I've quickly plotted the same data into DIPS, into the software to demonstrate the same point a little clearer. Um, so what we're interested in isn't the percentage likelihood of failure. That would only be useful with a full data set that represented the frequency of each joint set. For the purposes of this exercise, we're only interested in whether there is even one critical plane or intersection that indicates that failure could theoretically occur. In this case, we can see that planar failure is theoretically possible. And here I've shown an example of a planar failure on site that we've seen before in this presentation. Um, so I think what may have occurred here is actually some sort of composite failure, which is a mixture of both sliding shown in red and a form of topple, which is shown in green where the whole sheet of material probably slid down the face, but the material at the top might have rotated over the material at the bottom, leading to this much greater trajectory away from the face. And we approximated the slope height at about 80 meters using a digital rangefinder and measured the distance from the toe of the slope at about 80 meters as well. So that's the distance of one in one. Moving on to wedge failure, uh, with so many vertical joints, I wasn't really sure whether any of them would intersect to form wedges or not. It wasn't something that was too easy to spot on site, but the analysis indicated that wedge failure is theoretically possible. So 
going back through my images. <laughs> um, uh, this is an extreme example of a spire with joints that were not characteristic of the whole site, but they were localized here. And they combined with the sub-horizontal set to form wedges that would likely have failed in a sliding manner. Uh, and then toppling, that was the biggest concern we had for this site. So the orthogonal sub-vertical joints that run up the entire height of the slopes formed spires that were greater than 100 meters in height. The main one that we were concerned with was this here, and it was right above the proposed location for a number of buildings. We can see failures in front of it, and we can see large boulder debris on the slope crest behind it. And that actually was only really evident after using the drone to see its full extent behind the slope crest. So this, this picture is a textbook example really of a spire toppling failure, and these were really common across the site. This is another one that I noticed on the opposite end of the site, and we've got a similar looking spire in the front, but what really caught my eye was the slope behind it. If you look closely, you can see a sliver of a smooth looking face. And if we go back a few slides to the planar failure, I have a feeling that this face looked much the same as this one does now before it failed. So one of my main concerns and something that I really emphasized on site was the potential storm brewing here with the possible planar failure behind initiating a toppling failure of the spire in front of it. And again, there were buildings proposed right beneath this area. So the risk was extremely high. So to summarize this day out, um, we rocked up to this site with known kinematic stability issues and reaffirmed that yes, there were kinematic stability issues. Uh, as had been determined from the previous site visit, existing planar and toppling failures were very apparent, as were the potential for future failures. The reason we were on site was because the guidance of offsetting the buildings away from the slope had been misunderstood. Uh, so our findings instigated a conversation about the word risk, which I'd like to finish off talking about now. One massive positive from the day was that everybody in the room recognized that there was an issue. And this meant that fundamentally we had done our job well. In our half day visit, we had managed to point out to the client, the developers, and even our own team that there was a very real kinematic hazard on site. And crucially, we had done that before buildings had been constructed and even more crucially, before people had started to occupy those buildings. As we know, risk is the likelihood of a hazard causing harm. The main hazard in this case is the kinematic failure of the rock slopes, which could cause damage to buildings or worst case fatalities of people. Um, and the risk of this had is, is actually really difficult to quantify. And obviously this is what the client was very keen to understand. The main questions being along the lines of when are these failures going to occur? How long have we got? And those really aren't questions that are easy to answer. We did have some suggestions to mitigate the risk. The main point was obviously to observe the existing guidance of positioning the buildings um, away from the slopes. And this doesn't make a rockfall event any less likely to happen, but it does reduce the likelihood of harm being done. And this option was really difficult with the development proposed within a valley. Pushing buildings away from one rock slope either pushes them closer to another or into the center of a valley where risk from a flash flood event is also very real. And unfortunately, that was one of the other main constraints for this project, making positioning buildings very difficult indeed. Mitigation measures like berms, ditches, or dynamic barriers can be employed to mitigate some of these risks, but only following a detailed uh, geological mapping exercise and rockfall analysis, which would aim to identify the most likely fall trajectories. And that was our strong recommendation, and I believe it's what's being done now. So to me, to obtain as much information as you can in this kind of situation is an absolute necessity. Um, but that's my perspective as a geologist. And I wanted to highlight that there are different perspectives of risk depending on who you talk to. Unfortunately, in my experience of this day out, the risk boiled down to money, whichever way you or the try and try to look at it. So I wanted to conclude by returning to this image and saying that something that might be obvious to us as geologists may not be obvious to others. Um, and that's why we as engineering geologists and what we do is so very important. So with that, I'd like to conclude and invite any questions. Thanks very much, Tom, you're doing my job for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. If no one else is to jump in, I will uh, go for one. Um, so I thoroughly enjoyed this, um, the work that I do 
quite a lot of th involves thinking about using a rover on Mars. And what you've done here is sort of turned up, had limited time, limited uh, instrumentation, taken the, just the key measurements you need to be able to sort of make an assessment of the situation. Do you think that if you'd had sort of, you know, weeks of time, you know, a beautiful 3D model of all of the rocks from the drone footage and a much more thorough assessment that actually the outcomes uh, and the sort of, you know, client recommendations would have actually been very much different or very much more or less convincing? Potentially, yeah. So that's a great question. Um, it links to the work that's going on now. So the recommendation was to carry on doing geological mapping, use drone surveys that were basically free because they were, the client um, had his drone. And yeah, you would be able to do some beautiful point cloud analysis and, and photogrammetry on these slopes and de do some very detailed geological mapping. You'd be able to create a map that zoned um, each area of the site based on the, the rock fall analyses and the likely fall trajectories of rock falls. Um, so yeah, with, with the time available, well, with, with weeks of time, I'm not sure the outcome would be much different. Uh, I wouldn't want to comment because it could be that the recommendations of 1 to 1.5 times the height of the slope are totally accurate. That's general guidance. And it could be that the uh, detailed mapping suggests that it's more than 1.5 meters uh, times the height of the slope needed. You know, so that, that was a similar line of questioning that the client um, was going down. And <laughs> I think we probably gave him a similar answer. It could get better, it could get worse. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, so time is money. Thank you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Ivan, do you have a question at all? Uh, yeah, just a um, quick question. Um, and one of the things that strikes me is uh, looking through the pictures is, is that the failures aren't um, uniformly developed um, in the area. They seem to be concentrated um, at particular, particular spires, particular aspects. Is that a structural or a lithological control? Or did you get a feeling for? So the failures as far as I can tell, as far as the data suggests, are structurally controlled. So they're controlled by the discontinuities that weather over time um, and become weaker over time and eventually, <laughs> I say decide, but they eventually fail um, because the joints uh, weak weather. Um, the sandstone that we're seeing at this site is was fairly uniform across the site. Um, you have an upper sort of fasces and at lower fasces. Um, but between the two, the difference is mainly that one was cross bedded and one wasn't. Um, the, the controls on the failures were very much structural, I would say, sort of regardless of the lithology of the sandstone. If that answers your question, <laughs> I hope it does. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just um, uh, clarify that again. You, you're obviously doing this because um, somebody wants to do something there. But what what exactly do people want? To, you know, what what was your client? What does your client want to do there? And um, what ultimately is the risk? And 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 how are they going to have to ameliorate that risk? I mean, are they going to have to shot create the damn thing or cable bolt it to hell? What what um, <laughs> what what? What, what are they doing and what do they need to do based on, I appreciate a very a very quick, quick and dirty study from your um, perspective, but obviously there must be some recommendation. Yeah, what's the end of the story? Um, okay, so <laughs> one of the massive limits on uh, what they're allowed to do is that the Royal Commission for Alula, so the sort of the local governing body, um, won't really allow any sort of hard engineering structures. As soon as you try to put concrete or rock bolts into any of these um, slopes or spires, um, regardless of how useful those would be, um, you're, you're not allowed to do that because it ruins the aesthetic. Okay, <laughs> this is sort of what, we, what you have to deal with over there. The whole point of building resorts, which is the development idea, um, in this location is because it's a beautiful location. As soon as you spray a face with shotcrete, um, you lose that 
and it loses the appeal. So the only guidance really that we can give is to position buildings away from where they're going to get crushed by a big boulder. Um, and that's the, without more detailed mapping to sort of refine the areas that they can build in, that's the sort of the best that we would be able to give them. So the, the aim of the game really would be to better define the areas that they can more safely build in. And the risk um, would be sort of based on a zonation map, right? So within a certain area, there would be 95% likelihood that a rock would fall on in this area. Coming away from that, moving further away from the slopes, the risk would reduce and so on. So that's sort of the point, I guess, of the work here. Mm. Okay. Wonderful. Great. Um, there is a question that's just come through, but I'll um, carry on through though, because we just want to um, stick to sort of the schedule and we might pick up questions um, generally at the end if there's a bit of time from the other people attending. Um, so the next presentation, um, sorry, thank you, Tom, for that. <laughs> um, the next presentation is going to be by Ryan, Brian Beach from the West Midlands. So the opposite side of my East Midlands group, the opposition. Uh, can you see my screen? <clears throat> yeah. And is, is my sound okay? Sometimes my, my colleagues complain about my sound. You sound fine. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm Ryan B. I'm here to talk about um, variable glacial ground and liquefiable soil conditions. Um, I'm hoping with this presentation to sort of identify how you can work out where geohazards are and try and classify them early on in a um, in a project life, and then you can sort of use GI for prelim and detailed design to delineate where those geohazards are and their impact to the scheme, um, and then how you can treat them um, down the line. To to actually build something. So here's a picture of the site, um, just as a, as a, I'll run through quickly a bit of background on myself. So uh, back in 2011, as a young me with very long hair, um, doing A-level uh, geology, um, graduated from University of Birmingham in 2014, where, where I'm still back in Birmingham now, but um, 2015, I was from the University of Leeds, there was us all on the uh, rabble on the back of the, on, on the Leeds bus. Um, and then 2015 to, to now, um, I've uh, joined the civil engineering industry um, for Jacobs. I've been uh, preparing desk studies, doing GI scoping, uh, geomorphological mapping. I've been site, site super um, up and down the UK, uh, including sort of Inverness. Um, here I am mapping, um, logging landfill in um, Central, Central Ireland, which was an interesting job, uh, Preston, Birmingham and Slough. Uh, and some reporting and ground investigation and geotechnical design reports. I've typically been involved in the utilities, highways, a bit of waste, um, and this nuclear sector as well. Uh, fellow of Geological Society and a member of the Midlands Geotechnical Society. A bit of background on the project then. So um, we, what we're trying to do is trying to build this new uh, about 40 to 190 metre uh, dot key wall. Um, it's for a nuclear facility within the UK. Um, which comes with it. So it's quite a sensitive project with confidentiality constraints. Um, but due to that as well, um, the nuclear nature of it, it's got to go through um, independent technical assurance. So it's quite a stringent design basis. Um, so it has been categorised the geotechnical category three in line with Eurocode. Um, so we've got quite, um, the, the base of the design is quite stringent. We set by the project team. So we've got a, um, think about a 10,000 year um, return period for it, which is uh, a few parameters we've set are uh, considering a, an earthquake, five magnitude earthquake, um, a 0.25 G uh, peak ground acceleration, and the rest of it's all factored in with the Eurocade eight because it's importance factor, which is a 1.4 factor. So uh, back to the geology, um, our site's highlighted there in red. So it's uh, all underlain by the Kirk and Mudstone formation of the, uh, of the um, Mercy Mustang Group. And the BGS indicates that we have some tidal flat deposits, some localised um, glacial fluvial deposits and, and glacial till. There's some bits of peat knocking around as well. So our site was quite a new site, but the, the bit to the next of it had quite a lot of work done to it back in the 60s, well, between the 60s and the 80s. 
Uh, their historical ground sort of in, indicates that you have this hydraulic fill and there's upper glacial fluvial deposits of cohesive, interbedded cohesive and granular deposits. And then a more stiff and more dense lower glacial deposits of interbedded granular and glacial over, over the mudstone. That outside actually sort of has a bit, they've dredged all this out to put the hydraulic fill in. So um, we have a bit more um, of the upper glacial units uh, overlain by actual made ground on our site. So a bit of involvement to give you a timeline of the project so far. Um, back in 2015, um, there was a prelim GI that went on. Um, this was summarised by another team in, a, in their ground investigation report, and they identified the presence of um, silty sands uh, and the potentially liquefiable material, which they deemed as being um, quite a risk to the project. So they've, they've summarised that, and it was passed to us to do a, um, a prelim liquefaction assessment strategy document where we outlined how what, what we thought was there, how we were going to delineate it, and what we we're going to do to reduce that risk for the client so they could build it in time um, for the cost that they see. Um, following that, we did data gap analysis to work out how much, how many more boreholes we needed, so what depth, what kind of testing we needed. Um, and this is all concluded in the GI specification, which we took to site. Um, 2020, uh, our favourite year so far, um, we started the, the detailed liquefaction GI back in January um, and ran through to July. So um, when Boris locked us down, I think I had a week back here sat um, before they uh, asked me to go back out and um, get, get on site again. Um, following that, we've been doing a detailed liquefaction assessment and an outline ground treatment specification. But the bits I was involved with, um, Oh, sorry. And then since then, we've been, we've been liaising with the principal contractor and the ground treatment specialist and trying to undertake a bit of value engineering to um, try and save the client a bit more cost as well. And the bits I've been involved with are the bits that are in orange. So for the scheme, so we've got our existing wall through, through here. Um, and we're trying to build this uh, proposed dock key wall here. So um, the, the holes in red are the prelim GI uh, and the rest of them are the historical information we had from the dockyard. So from the prelim GI, the liquefaction assessment, the, the bits in orange, highlighted orange all through here um, indicated that there was uh, potentially liquefiable material um, based on low SPT values as well as gradings. Um, and the yellow, just didn't, we didn't have any SPTs for, um, but it did also indicate that the grading showed that it would resort with silty sand and could potentially liquefy. So our GI spec went ahead and we Pose quite an, a tight knit um, triangulated grid across the uh, the walls, try and really hone and delineate where that um, the ground conditions and where the liquefied material might be. Um, I'm going to focus on onshore today, which is um, just because the offshore is a completely different kettle of fish. But on, on land, we had cable percussion boreholes down. Um, the offshore, we did CPTs and, the, and we did two um, correlated boreholes with that. But I'll just focus on land today. Um, it's quite a constrained site being an old dockyard. We've got concrete caissons up here. We've got a block key wall, wooden piles, masonry crane tower, existing railway bridge through here, um, which we which runs through across here, uh, existing crane beams, anchor ties, piles, and with it being where it is, it's, there's a there's a high UXO risk as well. So uh, and they thought that you get COVID risk in there as well, just to, to sum it all up. So we use this uh, this um, graph to to work out what, what sort of material we, we're thinking is the potentially liquefiable, and it's the bit that falls between the gravel, sand, and silt portions here, which is this high possibility of liquefaction. So we we tried to get PSDs through quite uh, basically most of the soil units, so we could really hone in on what percentage of uh, what made up that soil. So we could work out really where it falls within this. Is it a high possibility? Is it, a, is it possible or is it low? Just so we could really delineate where that was. Here's an example of one of our kickouts from, um, from Holbase, our, our GI database. Um, as you can see, that this portion here, which is quite a lot falls in, which is this silty fine to medium sand, which is, uh, falls right in that, that boundary there, the high liquefiable. And then we've got this silty gravelly sand, which is sort of falls mainly slightly out, but then it, bits of it into this possibly liquefiable here. Um, just to point out, the um, usual GI standards of the BS5930 we use, they, they define bind as being this silt and clay portion at the 62 micron sieve. 
Um, ECA actually moves it this way to 0.01 and considers this, they define their fines this portion here. Um, and they split the silty sands into three main bits. So they've got the, this is a, a kick out from the, it's called curve three. So that's less than 5% fine. So all these fall sort of within this boundary here. Um, curve two, which is 15% to 5% fines. And then curve three, 35 to 15% fines. Anything above that, you've got enough fines that you're in this um, low risk area. So we, uh, undertook gradings on all the materials um, and then we applied it as a, as a geology code um, for the whole unit so we could pull through from whole base and change our model quite a lot to try and assess all the data. So uh, on, on the left hand side we have um, SPTM 160 corrected for energy loss and overburden to 100 kPa um, versus depth. Um, which also speaks to this second one here, which is the seismic shear stress ratio on, on the uh, on the y-axis and the SPTM 160, which is a simplified empirical method. So basically, if you're a curve one, which is let's say this upper one here, which is this curve here, if you're to the that curve one, if you're to the left of this, 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 this assessment is indicating you're potentially liquefiable as a, an assessment. Yeah, again, we've got curve two through here, which is this little bit through here. So if you're beneath that, which are these two points here, which are in here, which shows this is potentially poor material. And then curve three through here, which sort of shows that we've got a bit of poor ground down here, which is lying in through here. So what then we try and do is after this liquefaction system is undertaken, I try and apply it to the soil profile um, and work out where we have problems within that. And we um, taking that from just a borehole stick and then trying to sort of progress it into the geological model uh, as well as almost producing a liquefiable model as well. So we've got a, a full site model in 3D of trying to work out where this material is actually lying. So whilst I was on site, I was trying to construct some, um, some sections to try and work out what, um, what was going on. So we've got B through here and A. I'm going to run through B first. This is the historical information. So we've got the bits in red here. Um, I've put the liquefied materials in orange, try and work out what's going on, which is uh, in here. Um, so we've got this sort of May ground sat on top, this upper glacial, uh, glacial units, cohesive, lower, gla clo yeah, lower cohesive units, and then lower, lower granular over some weather mudstone in the Kirkham at depth. Based on this, we, we, we took the information, we had some really poor SPTs down through here of, of self-weight. And it was, um, so when we, were, we thought this was a, a lens type material, and uh, actually once we filled in with our GI, um, there was all these self-weight SPTs through here. And we asked them to, whilst on site, to top up the borehole to make sure that it wasn't liquefying um, whilst they were unloading. And we were getting uh, values of 13 to five and six, but it, was, it still failed. But instead of a lens feature, once we'd filled in, sort of indicated that we actually had sort of a more of a channel feature which is a bit, bit different kettle of fish when we try and treat it. See that red bit through there. Same again we uh, on the back of the wall so then we had only had one ball hole at the back of there we didn't have really a clue what was going on with it um, so we were sort of classified it through here and we have this poor material in the middle here uh, and some core loss and we were a bit unsure about the ground model and um, due to the site constraints. Um, we didn't know whether it was layer cake a bit similar to the other side or whether it was going to be lens like the other one we thought. So we filled in with some more um, of our uh, contemporary, more recent GI. Um, so this is the original one. And as we filled in, we've sort of proven it again that that um, channel feature appears to be coming through there again. We've got all this poor material with really low SPTs and, and then a bit of a base or gravel unit at the bottom. So yeah, again, you've got that channel feature through there. So looking at it in plan, what we tried to do is the, 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 the contracts have to lower the levels by three metres to foundation level anyway. So anything uh, less than three metres being dug out, which is not a problem. So they're going to dig out all this side over here, all the greens and yellows. The reds are up to anywhere between three to 17 and a half metres. Um, Groundwater is about three metres below ground level as well. So become, beneath that becomes difficult to excavate and replace. So based on this, we interpreted that the uh, glacial channel feature was sort of through here like that. So we went to the ground treatment to try and work out. So like I say, all this is going to get um, excavated and replaced. We've got a few areas of uncertainty through here. We're going to go back and fill in with GI to try and work out what's going on. But we, we suggested this area over here was uh, wet soil mixed where possible. 
um, and where we had in, in ground obstructions like piles and crane beams that weren't getting dug out, we we're going to jet grout around them. And to ISO, make sure that if this material here, which isn't getting ground treated, it was separate. If this fails, we're going to, um, to make sure it doesn't impact the wall, what we're going to do is put a jet grout cutoff curtain all around the edge here. When we pulled it into 3D, that, here's my conjectured um, area I thought based on just my site information. Once we got it back, actually put it in the accurate locations, ran it all through uh, with CAD, it was quite indicated that this here is indicative of the glacial channel feature. So my interpretation moved from here to sort of over here, which saved about 300 meters squared of, um, of ground treatment, which uh, the client was happy about and the, the principal contractor was happy about. They got less, less cost and they can sort of um, get through the program a bit faster for them as well, which is handy. So we produced that section to 3D so it could give it to the client, show what they, them what we thought was going on. The principal contractor uh, and also the ground treatment specialist so they could work out exactly they could put it into their models and work out what they need to do um so this is this is the start of um how we're going to try and run through this um over the next couple of years it allows that integration between us thinking me drawing on a bit of paper and then sort of getting it to to different stakeholders to work out solve this problem the future work on this then we've got uh, the development of our site site-wide 3d model which we're going to we're going to pull in the geology the liquid fiber layers and the obstructions as well so we're going to get um next so we can um we're all going to work the us the principal contractor the ground treatment all through one model um on site um we're going to continue doing the value engineer and the outside solution to try and mitigate that geohazard there's trials that are going to be going ahead in the next couple of months or so um further gi to reduce the uncertainty of the ground risk and areas we're not sure um, we had a few areas where we weren't sure whether we're on, um, we had an anomalies and we try and hone the GI to, to reduce that uh, through to construction and then on to verification at the end of that. Um, some references if you need them and any questions? Okay, we'll open that up to the judges. Thanks very much, Ryan. Nice to hear the word groundwater as a hydrogeologist has been thrown in there. I appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, I'll leap in with, with a couple of questions. Um, many thanks for that, Ryan. Um, I, yeah, I, I noticed that you mentioned groundwater level at the end uh, being three meters. That was gonna be one of my questions. Um, where you're maintaining a positive head in the water, while, head in the boreholes while you're doing the SPTs um, and whether there was any problems with, with boiling um, as, you, as they were going down. Well, there wasn't a prelim GI, which we weren't involved with. Um, but once I got hold of that information back um, when we were doing the gap analysis, I sort of identified that it was quite weird for the, to have a whole sequence of noughts. Um, it was about a two or three metre run of it. And I was, we weren't sure whether it was the data was the, the problem, that someone hadn't entered the data and it was just a null field that was coming through as naught. But we're going back to the actual to the logs and it, it was they were all noughts. Um, and it was actually the same contractor we used for the second round. So I, um, before we started on site, I got all the drillers around and had a chat with them and I just made sure they knew what we were trying to achieve. And even though we managed to increase the SPTs by keeping that positive head, which, which worked quite well, it still unfortunately failed some of the, the tests, but at least, mm. at least we made the effort of trying to validate that. Indeed. Um... When a CP rig's bailing its way through water-bound granular deposits, there's a, uh, everything gets churned up. Was there any concern about loss of fines uh, as you were going through those um, those sequences? Yeah, so, yeah, that's one thing. It's, we Yeah, that's true. I mean, the, we're, we're running off bulk bags and trying to do P PSDs on the bulk bags, and we work mm. with about the loss of fines, but in, in these ground conditions, there's not for us for the cost of it as well there wasn't too much else we could do the cp seemed to work quite well and for, for the cohesive parts we, we did have we'd have ut samples so we could do grains on those but we were considered well we did consider about the fines being lost in the, in the silty sands and materials more granular units indeed i mean i know it wasn't the focus of your, of your presentation but uh, was there was there appreciable differences between the the cp boreholes and the cpts the CPTs, yes. I mean, I wasn't allowed a fair on this site, which is quite interesting. So we went up and uh, the CPTs refused quite shallow, actually. They sort of 
we were hoping them to go a bit deeper and they were sort mm. of through through the um the dock silts and then they were terminating on the glaciers above that um so we we didn't get too much we tried to correlate the spts with the um with the the, the correlation holes try and um, they weren't too bad actually but we we weren't getting the same material um we sort of got a bit okay of also not not beneath it okay so that wasn't That's a way of um, making up for any loss of fines no unfortunately not no okay cool thanks okay that's me thank you We've got another couple of minutes. If um, anyone else has another question, yeah, I'm going to carry on on the same vein. I, 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 I have no experience of anything that you've been talking about. Um, what about the risks that you you have to deal with when when you're doing all this sort of site investigation? What are what are the what are the critical things that uh, you you have to protect your your you and your team against? Is that, is that more the health and safety or the technical risk? Sorry. Uh, whatever. whatever. Okay. Well, we, we, uh, there was two of us sort of covering these works. I think the, the key thing for this one was actually the overwater work. So um, working with the, 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 GI or the, the GI contractor and the principal contractor, we, when we're working on land, we make sure the hair is fenced off all the way along that, um, that front wall so no one could fall in, which was um, off the battle, um, with, especially with rigs going back and forth on quite a tight little area. Um, it was quite a nice little night, um, nicely knit team, really. But we made sure we had daily briefings to transfer any any incidents that happened in that area. Um, and when we were offshore working, we managed to um, we all had uh, overwater training, which was quite good. We all went and jumped in a quarry down in January, which was pretty <laughs> pretty chilly. But it was uh, it was it was good to, to do that just in case anyone did fall in. Um, and we had all the training, the, the uh, personal survival techniques, so we having to. Um, work it out to put on all the, especially from a land based. I mean, I, I don't do much swimming at all. So it was, uh, it was quite good to cover all that um, to out and cover it. Okay, okay thank that's, you. Great, that's actually the five minutes up. Peter, are you okay if I move on without thank you going to ask a question? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so we're actually on to the final speaker for today, which I, has flown by. Um, so we've got Christian, who's joining us from Yorkshire Regional Group. Very um, busy regional group up there. Um, yeah, so if you would like to share your screen and yeah, we'd love to hear what you're going to present on. So let me know when you can see that. Yep, yeah, it's pulling through now. Excellent. So, yeah. Welcome everybody, uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm Christian Garvey, I'm an engineering geologist at Arup. Um, um, yeah, looking forward to sharing with you some research I've done on uh, investigating the geochronological tools for dating the surface of Mars. So Mars is quite a hot topic at the moment, um, as people are probably aware of, you know, Perseverance rover landed there in February and the, uh, the Chinese Tianwen, I believe it was, uh, the rover landed fairly recently as well. So there's a lot of money and a lot of uh, research going into Mars at the moment. Um, tonight's storyline, going to walk you through um, a, a bit of the jargon, technical literature, and then on to section three, which will introduce you to um, the topography and the geology of Mars. Then section four, we'll look at um, the current um, method for dating the surface of Mars, which uses crater counting. And then section five to seven, we'll look at um, a possible alternative tool, which we can use um, also. And then I'll wrap up with a few conclusions at the end. So initially jargon busting, let's get a few of these terms out of the way. So geochronology, as geologists, we're probably familiar with um, uh, with this term is essentially the science of deriving um, the day, uh, the age of a rock from signatures inherent in itself, such as you know, fossils or, or radioactive isotopes. Crater counting is the method of, um, is a theory whereby the, a, crater, a greater crater density, <clears throat> which is exposed on a surface, may indicate a large, um, an older surface history, an older um, rock type, and the, also that the inverse is true. 
Radiometric dating is the method of determining the age of a rock or, or, or a mineral um, from looking at the radioactive isotopes and understanding its half-life can um, enable us to do that. So the objective of the study <clears throat> was really to answer two questions. The first being to challenge the conventional wisdom and understand whether crater counting is a reliable method for dating the surface of Mars. And secondly, to ask whether radiometric dating could be used as an alternative method to strengthen its reliability um, going forward. The existing literature shows that Hartman and others have, um, have really pioneered crater counting and it's quite a mature science. It's been around since the 1970s. However, it's not without its critics who argue that the exhumation, the depositional history on Mars is relatively unknown. <clears throat> and also, when we look at radiometric dating techniques, although they've been proven to, um, um, to be used quite well at Gale Crater for in situ methods, they've not really been looked at for um, a remote uh, dating technique, it's a remote dating technique. So identifying this research gap whereby crater counting is a mature method, but it's, it may still have its um, uncertainties. And also looking at radiometric dating as a possible uh, remote method. This is the gap that I, I wanted to, uh, to look at in a bit more detail. Looking at the topography of Mars, this uh, figure one shows a stark bimodal um, distribution really. So the dark colours show high elevations and the pale colours indicate lower elevations. And what we see is in the southern hemisphere we have higher elevations and the northern, northern hemisphere um, lower elevations. Making our way across in the west we have the Tharsis bulge and the famous Olympus Mons. And going across to the east we have the landing sites of the per Perseverance rover and the Curiosity rovers just for, just for personal interest and reference. The geology of Mars, you know, initially it looks quite complicated as all kind of global geological maps do. Um, the next slide, it did, well, it's, it's been drawn by Tanaka um, in 2014, but the, the epochs and the, um, the units I, I want to look at um, are highlighted here. So initially we have the Noachian unit in figure B, and that's the oldest unit, and that is really dominated by the highland um, geology in the south and the southern hemisphere. The Hesperian unit is slightly younger, and that dominates the northern hemisphere, and the lowland units and the um, volcanics in the west around the Tharsis bulge. So the crater counting methods, it's the, co the conventional wisdom it takes that it's an appropriate method for dating the surface. And it's largely been uh, calibrated from the lunar crater populations. And these isochrons, yeah, the, the moon isochron has been adapted and shifted slightly to represent, to better represent the atmospheric and the uh, gravitational differences on Mars. And again, as I said before, an older surface rock would expect to see a greater crater density. So looking at the primary question, is crater counting a reliable method? Looking at figure five, what we've got is the topographical map in the background and overlaying onto that is a crater density map where the paler colors indicate a greater crater density and the darker colors a lower crater density. And what we initially see, and it's quite obvious, is that the larger crater densities um, are largely confined to the lower hemisphere, the southern hemisphere and the highland areas. Taking this one step further and overlaying the crater density data onto a simplified geological map, we see that the higher crater densities are again confined to the highland geological unit. However, this isn't necessarily surprising as, it, as the map developed by Tanaka is, and is widely accepted is actually based on crater counts. Therefore, it's quite difficult to independently verify whether it is actually a reliable method.
So this brings us into radiometric dating and whether this can actually be used to um, strengthen the reliability of this method. A brief uh, look at the theory of, of, um, of radiometric dating. So I want us to, to look at the potassium argon theory in particular, and the decay of the radioactive isotope potassium-40 um, through time. So what it does, it decays into calcium-40 and argon-40. And with argon-40, it emits a gamma ray. The half-life of potassium-40 is 1.3 billion years, which makes it appropriate for use of data for, for dating on Mars. And the gamma ray, and the, and the decay with the gamma ray is picked up by um, gamma ray spectrometry. So what would we expect to see if we looked at this data? We perhaps expect that the variation in potassium is controlled by the radioactive decay of potassium-40 into calcium-40 and argon-40, whereby a low potassium concentration would suggest a decay of potassium-40 over time, indicating an older surface. Hence, would expect a high crater count where this is. And vice versa. So we'd expect a high potassium concentration where we have lower crater counts indicating a younger surface. Looking at figure eight here, um, we have the potassium concentration in the background and that's overlaying with the crater density that we're familiar with. The paler colors indicate a high density and these generally marry quite well in the central portion of this map where we have a low potassium concentration. In the northern hemisphere, we tend to see a high potassium concentration and a very low crater density. So this is as we expect, really, as, as we hypothesized before. However, there are anomalies to those who have you, uh, of you who are quite astute. So rolling on to the discussion, I'm going to look at the first anomaly, which is around the Tharsis bulge, and also the anomaly which I've coined region X. And, and perhaps looking at these, we'll understand um, a, a few shortcomings, potential shortcomings of crater counting. So the Tharsis bulge, as I pointed to earlier, is over to the Western hemisphere. This is characterized by low crater density and also a low potassium concentration. And the area in red is Olympus Mons. Zooming in to Olympus Mons, we'll, uh, um, we've got a section here through it. And what we see is that it's got a fairly broad base and, and um, shallow slopes, indicative and analogous to mafic or basic producing volcanoes on Earth. So this is one possible explanation of the low potassium concentration that we see here. Looking at anomaly two, region X, which is on the edges of the map, we see that this area is characterized by a high crater density and a high potassium concentration. However, this area of region X, looking at the geological map excerpt that we saw earlier, is, con is constrained to the highland units, so the older um, geology. However, there's no reasonable explanation why this should have a high potassium concentration. Looking at crater counting limitations, it has assumed that there's a, com a consistent impact rate through time and that and those impacts have been spatially random. Secondary crater cratering has been discussed in literature to possibly contaminate the crater count. Therefore, if we look at this schematic in the bottom left, we see that perhaps this younger unit of region X has been contaminated, its signatures have been contaminated, crater, crater signatures have been contaminated by the secondary impact craters. So where we get a primary impact crater, secondary ejector have flung off and caused further cratering. Also, the exhumation process could be a reason for the similar crater density signatures in this area, whereby younger rock has been eroded and subsequent cratering has caused these regions to appear the same age. Now, looking at some of the limitations of my own research, it's not flawless, I suppose, is that the crater data set that I've used is 
uses quite a trimmed um, data set, you know, perhaps this could be good in terms of eliminating secondary ejector data. And there's also, I've also not applied a weighting to the size of craters. Looking at potassium concentration, the variation, I've assumed that the variation in potassium is due to the decay of potassium 40 remaining within the closed system. And also that we can see the potassium um, and it's all detectable. So wrapping up with a few conclusions, the primary question of whether it's a liable, crater counting is reliable, no, not in isolation, I don't believe. And there are many significant limitations. The secondary question of whether it's um, radiometric dating can be used. In some instances, it's proven to be um, a, proven to uh, find a good inverse relationship. However, in others, as we've explored, there are some significant anomalies. So some key takeaways. Radioactive dating of potassium-40 is remote and could provide a relative dating technique. And it could also be used to explain processes that aren't um, revealed simply by looking at craters. And as ever, remote methods are ambiguous. So taking it further, I'd like to look at other um, GRS concentrations at the rover locations where they have uh, taken in situ measurements and possibly ground truth these observations. And lastly, the multi-million dollar question of whether there is life on Mars. Thank you. Great, thank you so much that, Christian. Sorry for having to run off to collect some groundwater samples halfway through, so I missed part of that, but <laughs> um, no, that was really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to presume that um, Peter might have a question. <laughs> um, so. Just a couple, of, yeah, just a couple of, <laughs> of things. Um, so you said at the end that you hadn't weighted the craters by their size, but fundamentally, crater counting to get the uh, relative dating, or in fact, absolute dating, is based on the size frequency distribution of craters on the surface. So what did you do? Um, so I looked at um, purely the frequency of, um, of craters in a particular area, rather than, I suppose, weighting them for yeah, for size, and therefore you'd have a better understanding of whether they were primary and um, or secondary. And I think that could affect the uh, the relationships. Okay, uh, and the other question I have was about uh, we did a, what the is the so you were using looking at using the gamma ray spectrometry and to come up with the different concentrations to suggest the different ages of global scale geological units. Um, doesn't that, to some extent, require those global scale geological units to be fundamentally made of the same stuff so that when they were formed, whenever that was, they had the same sort of starting inventory? Um, um, well, potassium is, is a very common and very abundant element, as we know, and and therefore, it's it doesn't necessarily. Yeah, well, and that's why potassium and argon are quite um, a well used um, relation uh, ratios, because yeah. they're abundant in many different rock forms, and rock formations. Um, so, um, yeah. it's, fair, it's fair enough. The last thing I was going to ask yeah. was sort of touched on one of your like final points about uh, the, like the rover work. So I know that um, one of the references you mentioned, Farley et al., had, you know, they had looked, done some radiometric uh, dating with the Curiosity rover, sort of in, in situ, which is you know the first actual date from Mars, because crater counting on you know without a rover with the super, with correct equipment is essentially the only thing you have to. Uh, age the surfaces, but um, the method you were sort of a technique you were describing, what sort of is the minimum spatial scale it could provide relevant information on? Or how, how big an area could you, you know, date? For the... Area? Yeah, but, but the, 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 
looking at the potassium concentrations. Yeah, so, it was a yeah. minimum, minimum sample kind of required to get meaningful data. Um, well, I, I think you'd have to have a significant, yeah, a, quite a significant um, sampling regime and across the whole surface, perhaps. You know, that's why looking at remote methods, we can easily look global scale. That's why crater counting has been such a good tool, you know, not only on on the on Mars but also elsewhere, and and that's why you know rov rovers have quite a limited span in where they can travel. Oh, so really pushing, yeah, the remote methods for it's now. Of, yeah, it's a lot of dollars for just one yeah, one, uh, yeah, one data yeah, point. Yeah. But... And perhaps we we'll understand more when the rovers come in the future and collect those samples and then return them to Earth, and you know we can really you know ground truth in our observations oh absolutely um, there's a the sample return is the next sort of big thing and that will provide a huge amount of uh, information and dating stuff will be fundamental to that i think okay cool thank you very much uh, simon or ursula do either of you have a question for christian um nothing from me thanks no nothing from me Matthew, do you have a question? I enjoyed that, Christian. Thank you very much. Um, how would you say the remote sensing on Mars, how, how does its challenges compare to remote sensing on Earth? And um, do you think we could learn anything from looking at other planets and the techniques that you're using to imp improve the remote sensing, which is done on Earth? I suppose that the bonus that we have um, on Mars is that it's unvegetated. Um, therefore, there are quite, you know, it reduces a significant obstruction. Um, nevertheless, on Earth, we have, you know, very detailed geological maps of significant areas of the planet and, you know, economically areas. That's that's how, um, that's how, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of these maps have been created, especially around elemental concentrations, such as uranium and, and other mineral explorations. Um, so the remote methods on Mars are very ambiguous and they remain ambiguous, as, as we were saying, until they're ground truth. There's not really, yeah, there's nothing to really baseline them against or, or um, have any, you know, yeah, hard, um, hard reference points. Okay, thank you very much. Great, well because you have all kept your time so wonderfully and um, we're actually on schedule if a few minutes um, early, which um, thank you so much for, yeah, everybody sticking to time. It makes it a lot smoother for everybody. So congratulations on that bit. Um, I just want to say one thing that I did forget to um, do a shout out to um, the South Wales regional group that Tafford is um, representing today. So I didn't want them to feel left out. I just had forgotten that part at the beginning. So there we go. Everyone feels included now. Um, what we're going to do now is do a little bit of a short break. I'm going to start a, a secret um, deliberation Zoom call. Um, I'll leave this call in the hands of um, the Early Career Network's um, chief. Um, Matt, who's on the call, um, and he will just sort of make sure that this keeps running. Oh, look how smooth we are. Um, yeah, one of the things just whilst this is up, just to remind people, um, if people on this call haven't already don't already follow the Early Career Network, um, we are across quite a few different social medias, which are sort of shown on the bottom there, and that's where one of the main routes that we put out any of the content. Um, we try to do career stuff, educational pieces, and release what events we've got coming up. Um, the main thing we have coming up next is um, a very interesting lecture series that will be starting next month and will move throughout the rest of 2021, hopefully finishing in an in-person end of the year event. So I'm going to start the meeting. Um, the 
judges, if you could just turn off your cameras and mute yourselves, we should be able to join both at the same time. And hopefully we will be um, back with you as soon as possible. Great, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, I know for one, I don't envy the judges having to choose a winner there. I thought they were four fantastic presentations, so thank you very much. I'm gonna take the opportunity um, to just introduce our new committee member. So anybody who was at our AGM last month will know that our long-standing committee member, Josh Hughes, has retired. Um, so Aisha will be joining. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge and a part-time exploration geologist. So we look forward to working together to move the ECN forward. And then finally, a shameless plug. Um, as Deborah just said, we are launching a guest lecture series starting in June. So building on today's topic, the first lecture will be on communication with the geosciences. And then we're, um, we've got a range of topics once a month. Um, we'll always aim for the, the, the final Thursday um, of the month. So hopefully there'll be, there'll be something there for everyone. And um, there's a link to our social media. Um, if you do give us a follow, we, we try and post different different stuff across the, the three channels. So on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So any anyone that you've got, please do give us a follow and um, you can keep up to date on our on our activities. Okay, we are back. And um, let me just check. I have everybody. Sorry about the tense wait, everyone. Um, I've got Simon. And have we got Peter? <laughs> We're going down. <laughs> ah, he's made it. Beautiful. Great. Okay, so, um, okay, firstly, um, again, thank you so much for everyone taking part, for bearing with us. Um, whilst we um, went through that process. So I'm just going to hand over to Peter, who's going to put everyone out of their misery. Yeah, okay. So I'll, first of all, thanks everyone for the effort you guys have put in and sort of the continued effort. I didn't realise this has been sort of dragged out so long over the different stages. Um, but it's really good that you've stuck with it um, because there's just, you know, so few of you, we're just going to go for one winner rather than, you know, ranking you cruelly. Um, but, and that, but yeah, and so that is going to be uh, to Tom Pickard. Um, we really liked the presentation. There's a great use of the imagery that you had. Um, we liked that a sort of a complete, concise story um, with it really, sort of, and particularly like how it you know, put together the story and it brought it to, you know, into the context of what was happening. It was very clear what the, the questions were at the end. So that was good. So I think well done uh, and well done everyone else for persevering putting things together. Um, I personally, not a technical, geotechnical engineering person, but just have a sort of a, a geology background, really quite enjoyed sort of an insight into what you guys do in that sort of part of the industry. So well done once again. Yeah, yeah, so honestly, congratulations from um, everybody on the Early Career Network. And um, yeah, it was, it was just really interesting for me, this whole evening and thank you for putting up with me not being able to use zoom and etc etc mm -hmm. and being a bit late for those people as well but um yeah it's really enjoy I, I hope that you've enjoyed yourself I, I know it's not quite the format that we all would want but we will get there um and yeah I don't know if Matt just wants to close out as our fearless leader yeah, thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you for hosting and a huge thank you to the, the three guest judges. I thought all the presentations were fantastic and you've all done yourselves proud and obviously a huge congratulations to Tom. Um, I'll be in touch with all of you to get your um, your prizes over to you and thank you very much for taking part. Perfect. Well done, everybody. Well done, everyone. Thanks for inviting me along to yeah. help judge it. It's been really interesting. Indeed, I'd like to echo that. It's been great presentations, been fascinating to hear what you were up to. And uh, well done to everybody. Great. Well done. Thank you. All right. Cheers. 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 Bye. Thanks. Uh, bye.